meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission for Wednesday, June 7th, 2023. Please come to order. This evening's meeting will be a hybrid planning and zoning meeting hosted in person at the Nathaniel B. Green Community Center, 32 Church Street, Gilbert, Connecticut, No Kentucky Road, second floor, as well as virtually by Zoom. During this meeting, our procedures will be as follows. One, when you first enter the Zoom meeting, you'll be in a virtual waiting room until the meeting post is admitted to you. Two, please be aware that your camera, if you have one, and your microphone will be muted by the meeting host when you enter the meeting. You can turn on your camera at any time so that you can be seen by others when and if you choose to in order to run an efficient and orderly meeting in this virtual environment unless stated otherwise by the meeting chairman during the meeting. The meeting host will um, keep everyone other than the commission members muted. You will still be able to hear everything said by the commission members even if you're muted and if your camera is not on. There will be opportunity for public comment during public hearings, at which time public participants will be unmuted. Three, the secretary will read the call of the meeting as published according to Governor Lamont's executive order. Four, during the public hearing, the applicant will be invited to present the application, explaining to the commission and others present what is being requested. The meeting host will share all related documents on the screen as needed. In addition, all applications and supporting materials for each application on the agenda are available through the public meeting calendar page of the town website, www.guildfordct.gov, and also through a direct link on the planning and zoning page. Five, comments of town agencies will be read for each application if there are any. There will be clarifying questions from the commissioners. Six, there will then be an opportunity for clarifying questions from the audience. Please raise your hand through the Zoom platform and wait to be called on if unmuted. As this public hearing must be recorded, it's necessary for speakers to identify themselves each time they speak by stating their name and address. Seven, for all clarifying questions are after all clarifying questions are exhausted, those who wish to speak in support of the application will be asked to come forward, state their name and address for the record, and make a statement. Then those who wish to, to speak in opposition to the application will ask to come forward, state their name and address for the record, and make a statement. Eight, the applicant will then have an opportunity to address any questions or concerns raised by the public or commissioner. Nine, once the public hearing is closed, the applicant is free to leave or stay for the balance of the public hearings and the regular meeting, during which the commission will try to reach a decision on the application. The applicant will be notified in writing as the decision of this commission and has a right to appeal to Superior Court if desired. Ten, decisions of this meeting are available the day after the meeting by calling Planning and Zoning Department at 203-453-8039 or by emailing planning.zoning at guildforct.gov after 9 a.m. <clears throat> 11, all actions taken on applications to the commission will be by roll call. All commissioners and staff will identify themselves for the record before speaking. See this evening are the following members who will please identify themselves. Kevin Clark. Present. Bill Freeman. Present. Ted Sands. Present. Bill Johnson. Here. Sean Cosgrove. Here. I haven't seen Frank. Right. And I'm Scott Evan Chair. All tenants tonight are Jason Martin. And Larry Rizzolo. Here. All right, you'll be seated tonight. Uh, staff present are Steve Manick, interim town planner, uh, Nigel Mills, assistant town planner, and Janique Morgan, administrative assistant planning and zoning. <laughs> this meeting will be recorded via the Zoom platform and made available on the town website for viewing. The secretary will now read the legal notice. May I ask, um, as secretary, that the notice be put on screen? Because I've got a, a legal notice in front of me, but it does not include NAP. The NAP I'm sorry. NAP was previously legally noticed, so it's not um, noticed again. Uh, okay. okay. All right. So I'll, I'll read the notice. Gilbert Planning and Zoning Commission notices hereby given that the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission will hold a hybrid public hearing on June 7th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Attendees may join at the Nathaniel B. Nathaniel B. Green Community Center or via Zoom platform by using the following link. Due to limited space, members of the public wishing to attend in person are asked to register with the Planning and Zoning Department. The following application will be heard. Uh, Greg Fettis, 
Pettis Engineering LLC, 230 Water Street, Map 32, Lot 97, Zone MR1, Special Permit and Coastal Site Plan for Additions and Modifications to Existing Marine Commercial Buildings. Al Secundino, um, A. Secundino and Son, Inc., 441 Boston Street, Map 48, Lot 52, Zone R3, Special Permit and Coastal Site Plan for an addition connecting the two buildings of an existing daycare business following variance approval. Copies of these applications are available for inspection in the Planning and Zoning Office and, and on the town's website. At this hearing, persons may attend via web connection and shall be heard. All <laughs> correspondence shall be submitted to planning.zoning at guildfordct.gov 24 hours prior to the meeting day. Documents are available at the Planning and Zoning Office, bell 203-453-8039 for assistance dated in Guilford, Connecticut, the 16th day of May, 2023. Scott Edmund, Chairman. Secretary, I must uh, entertain a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Uh, second. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, I have two thing, two announcements before we get started. Uh, the first is, uh, as you heard in that legal notice, um, we are asking for 24 hours for you to put to send in anything that you would like to be part of the public record for the upcoming meeting 24 hours before that meeting. Uh, because our staff is a little taxed right now as we look for a town planner um, to, uh, to replace our previous one. Uh, we're going to start adhering to that 24 hours before the meeting stipulation. If you get it in after, and if they happen to have the time, then they will get it to us and get it as part of the meeting. Um, if not, then it will just become part of the next meeting if there is one for that item. Um, just wanted to let everyone here and everyone that might be watching on the Zoom call, I mean, watching on the uh, recording know. Second thing, um, and I apologize if you didn't get the word, but the applicant for Anna Maria Vistun Nap. Uh, requested for their application to be tabled to a uh, June 7, 2023 meeting. So if you're here for that one, um, I apologize that you didn't get the word that they requested the table, um, but it's going to be moved to, um, I'm sorry, to July 5th. Um, that being said, if you need to leave, go ahead and leave. Just try to do it quietly. Sorry about that. We just found out today. Sorry that. that being said, could I entertain a motion to adjust our agenda to move this student app up to the beginning of the meeting? So moved. I uh, have a second. A second. Second. Awesome. Aye. All right. Would anyone like to make a motion to table to July 5th, 2023? Second. All right. Uh, Larry Rizzo. Yes. Kevin Clark. Yes. Ted Sands. Yes. Bill Freeman. Yes. Bill Johnson. No. Yes. 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 Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Well, Scott, any special yes. reason that going to the fifth as opposed to either the twenty-first or the nineteenth? So the reason why it's getting tabled is because they have some work to do yet. Uh, CTDEP has a request in for them to review some endangered species, and they also are working on their site plan to. Uh, update the open space that's being offered. So they've got some work to do. Um, that's why they asked for July 5th. Just for everyone's information, July 5th will be the last potential open meeting that they can have for the application before we have to respond to it. Um, so we'll be hearing it back. Yeah, so uh, just to clarify, Scott, um, I think they 
they could, if they choose to, if they can't get all their ducks lined up, they could withdraw and re reapply. Do you want to speak to that, Steve? Yeah, they could reapply. And, and just to clarify, I believe that's July 5th is the last day you can keep the hearing open until right. uh, you have 65 days to deliberate after that. You just have to close so the hearing. Suppose we then have 65 days to deliberate, correct? Yeah. So, uh, Steve, um, I, I, I would assume all the commissioners have read your um, memo of June 5th. Um, it was very well done. It was very thorough. And I think uh, that among maybe some other factors was the reason that the applicant decided to move to July 5th. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, just FYI for all listening, for John, he's mentioning something that's available on the website uh, if you would like to go look at that memo. Um, if you don't mind, my concern is that a lot of people take that week off. And so, people that might want the opportunity to speak um, very well could be away. And I, I know that's their choice, but I'm just curious why we can't actually on the 21st, um, as opposed to yeah, right up against the wall. Second, so. Okay. Um, your, your points well taken. Um, this is where we are. Okay. Um, all right. Next item on the agenda is Greg Fetus, Fetus Engineering LLC, 230 Water Street, now 32, lot 97, zone so MR-1. Special permit and coastal site plan for additions and modifications to existing marine commercial buildings. Do we have? For this application. Yeah, good evening. My name is Greg Fettis with Fettis Engineering, uh, a professional engineer licensed in the state of Connecticut, representing the owner of Guilford Boatyards. Uh, what we're proposing, and I don't know if we need to be looking at a site plan or sharing a site plan. Um, yep. that's, put up, have it available, or we can uh, ask our town staff to put up. Uh, I can do it if. Up to you. Yeah, uh, why don't I do it that way? I can point the stuff. Okay. Um, you know, it says that uh, the host is disabled participant screen sharing. <laughs> So if you want to put it up, that's fine. Okay. Um, if, while you're while we're working on that, can you should, should we good now? It should be good for you to share. That. Should be good now. Okay. It's not that I can share. All right, so the site's located at uh, 230 Water Street. Um, it's an existing uh, boat yard, has an existing uh, dockage, um, uh, ability to put boats in the water. Um, so that the in boat storage in the winter, uh, there's an existing store and I'm just gonna blow up the screen a little bit. Um, Get in the right position here. All right, I think this has everything we're doing now. So there's an existing building, it's labeled number five. You can kind of barely see it. It's, uh, it's the existing marine store on site. Uh, it's in rough shape to be probably kind. Um, 
it's ready to to kind of fall in on itself. Um, so it needs to be replaced. So we looked at replacing it basically in kind, uh, but we thought it, it would, my client thought it'd be better just to do an addition to the existing building uh, to the north, which is this building here. Um, so we would propose to demolish this building. Uh, so you can see it's a little bit, it's not a true rectangle. Uh, but that building has about 1,262 square feet of floor area. The addition we're proposing is 36 by 30, uh, and that is uh, 1,080 square feet. The addition will be elevated compared to the existing building by about almost seven feet uh, to be flood compliant. Um, it will be built on a slab. Um, uh, and basically it's to replace the Marine store. So a couple things, one of the reasons we did it was from a safety standpoint, there will be the ability to look through from the, where the, the, the cashier or the one employee that's in there into the other building, which it's labeled office building, but it's, it's got a, a little bit of office in there, but it's mainly where they do some of the repairs uh, on the boats. Uh, so it's kind of a visual inside the building um, and it kind of consolidates the, uh, the efforts uh, of the boatyard. Um, uh, so we're also adding parking, uh, more defined parking than what's out there. Uh, today we're adding a handy uh, accessible space. Uh, that will be the only one that's paved. Uh, and then the rest of it will be gravel. Uh, you can see we're adding uh, 16 spaces, uh, very defined um, and a gravel through fare uh, to the rest of the site. Uh, the one other thing uh, we're... Oh. Uh, scroll, I scrolled up somehow, I don't have my... Uh, All right, so we're also replacing this building number four, uh, which again is in rough shape. That's a storage building. Uh, he's, he wants to store his, uh, the outboard motors in there. Uh, again, we're raising that up. The current finished floor is about elevation nine. We'll be raising that to 14, about five feet. Uh, we're proposing a gravel ramp um, in order for easy access into, into the building, uh, but it will be up a five additional feet, which will give us plenty of uh, free board above the flood levels. Um, so those are the two kind of big picture items we're, we're doing. Uh, there's some staff memos out there and or letters uh, that we have some items to address. Uh, one of the big things that you probably read about was uh, the, the area to the I guess it would be the uh, southeast. This area down here is where they store uh, the boats in the winter. Um, uh, there was staff that was running in. What's that? What's it? Um, so staff was looking at some aerial photographs. And my client did add some crushed stone uh, that was mistakenly taken for mm -hmm. Millings. Uh, Millings, uh, I, I would agree, Millings can compact to a more impervious um, surface. Uh, but I was out there on Monday uh, just reviewing 
um, what was put down and it is an actual crushed stone that will allow direct infiltration into the ground ground below. Um, and I believe, I know Janice, uh, the town engineer was also out there, I believe Monday or Tuesday and concurred uh, with, with our interpretation of the product that was put down. Um, so that's one of the, that was one of the big things and the uh, staff did, was looking to do like a uh, uh, stormwater management plan because of the millings and so forth. But I think they've uh, since that, and there may not be anything formal yet in the record, but the staff has agreed with our interpretation and that a, a, a separate stormwater management uh, plan would not be required. Uh, we do have a couple little items left, I think, to to address. One is a uh, a detail we're proposing to put all the roof water uh, from the rebuilt buildings and the addition uh, into an underground infiltration system that would capture and store the, at least the first inch of rainfall. Um, staff is also looking for potentially some additional silt fence, which we uh, we would comply with that, and some maybe some additional erosion control, uh, which we would comply with. Uh, staff is also looking for a detail of the gravel parking lot. Uh, we do have uh, what, what we consider a pervious gravel parking lot detail. So that'll be uh, added to the plan um we did show the limits of boat storage on the on the <laughs> wetland side or the river side we did not show it on the balance of the site so we'll be adding that it would be on the uh and we'll actually show the the current limits of the crushed stone um it's not i wouldn't say it's too far off from what's shown on the plan um that island in the middle uh, right, mm. right here was covered with crushed stone, and then uh, it did expand a little bit. Uh, so we'll we'll locate that and make sure that's accurately depicted. Um, I think that I think, and there there's some issues with uh, Janice was concerned about how we're constructing the addition because the existing building does not is not raised to the correct flood level uh, we're not proposing to um so there's a couple of different ways we can handle that we th we're just building a shell there's no you know there's no kitchen there's no bathroom there's no you know it's it's a very simple shell so we don't think we'll be above the 50 percent substantial uh improvement number which would make us uh, raise that existing building up to flood level. Uh, so we don't think we need to do that. Um, that. That's something she thought maybe could be handled at the building department level. I would agree with it. Typically that's where it's handled, but we did think about that. Uh, I do think we're, we're under, we're, we're positioned to get a, an appraisal of the existing building to see what the actual value of that is. And you know, we basically need to stay under 50% of the value of that. Uh, there is ways to to do it if we're over without bringing that into compliance. Mm. Uh, I don't think we want that office or that existing building raised up five or six or seven feet, um, just because I think it would look out of place and now we would not really be able to get into that level. Uh, now you can drive right in um just... hey greg this is sean cosgrove I, I thought you said that the existing building um that you outlined was going to be taken down yeah i did um, he's talking about the existing office building yeah Right. So this this building here that's labeled existing office building, finished floor 7.65 is not coming down. This but building over one, here is right. exactly. building yeah. number five, that is coming down. Right. Um, and 
the store basically is going to move over into this shaded addition. Right. That'll be at flood level or above, or a couple feet above. Um, but I think we want to avoid trying to raise that existing building where they do the majority of their repairs. Um, and there's a couple of different ways to do it. One, we stay under the 50% substantial improvement, or two, we actually build a, a separate structure that's right up, you know, within a a hair of the other building. So they're independent. Yeah, um, so they're, they're, they're so in other words, they're not connected. Correct. So that's that's a way to do it. Um, you know, there's there's pluses and minuses to that, but I, I don't, you know. We'll, we'll, I'd like to cross that bridge when we get to the building department, uh, but we, we are very aware of it. Janice pointed it out. Um, I think she's on the same page we are uh, with building a separate structure if that's what we need to do. And will, will building four be taken down? Building four will be taken down and rebuilt in kind, except it's being raised up to get above the flood level. Thank you. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If I missed anything from any of the reviews that you'd like to me to address now, we're going to be coming back with revised plans that staff has commented on, and hopefully we resolve all of their concerns by the 21st. Any questions from commissioners before we move on to town staff comments? Question? Yep. What year was the existing office building built? I'm not sure. I'd have to. I can get that information for next time. I, I, I. They didn't separate the buildings. I think on the on the field card or the or property or card. Is that back? Mr. Kuhn, I think it was of the same vintage as Building Five, which is being taken down. I know it's in much better shape than Building Five than Building Five. <laughs> and I think it's a different construction also. Um, I think there's some concrete block and so forth uh, on a portion of it, at least. But I can find out the years for the, of all the buildings for next time. I'm just I'm just curious about the, the valuation of the building as it relates to the new construction and what new construction costs are. Yeah. Well, we... I don't want to get you guys get in a pickle where... You know, all of a sudden the, the construction costs go over what you think, and you get into a situation of significant improvement, and it becomes a problem. Yeah, so we we will hopefully resolve that before at the, at the building department level. Uh, in worst cases, we just build a separate structure that's not physically attached to the existing building, but it's right in the same spot. <clears throat> Any questions for me? Uh, for you and Townstaff comments? All right, what do we have for Townstaff? Uh, we have Mr. Philip Johnson read the first one. If you can pull it up on the screen, I would love to. Yeah. Really stop sharing. Uh, Greg, can you stop sharing, please? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> like kindergarten, did it? Could you stop sharing? <laughs> uh, this is planning and zoning commission from Shirley Minkins RS June 7th 2023 RE 230 Water Street map 32 lot 97 edition the health department has contacted thank you very much contacted the engineer to submit a B 100A application for the proposed addition at 230 Water Street. Soil testing is required for any increase in square footage for the building to determine that a code complying area is available on site. We are working with the engineer to schedule soil testing for next week. Any changes made to the engineer plan will need to be submitted to the health department for review. Shirley Minkins, RS. Uh, Mr. Bill Freeman, do the next one. Nope. Bring it up. 
You know, June 2nd, 2023, to the Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission from Kevin DeGee, environmental planner, re referring to coastal area management review and special permit 230 Water Street, Guilford, Connecticut, 06437, assessor's map 32, lot 97. The applicant is proposing to demolish the existing store and replace it with an addition to an existing building adjacent to the West River along with the replacement of an existing storage building at a higher elevation near the tidal wetland. The application and the site plan indicate that the stormwater from the roof leaders from the store addition and the storage building replacement will be directed to underground infiltration galleries. No sizing information location of the infiltration galleries or product details as shown in the submitted plan. Portions of the proposed construction is located within the FEMA flood zone of AE11. The coastal resource policies applicable for the property are developed shorefront, coastal hazard area, water, coastal waters, nearshore waters, shorelands, and tidal wetlands. The plan shows some erosion and sedimentation control measures to the east of the reconstructed storage building, which would be expanded to include the whole length of the storage building and ramp. No erosion and sedimentation control measures are shown around the proposed building addition or the parking area to be installed at the location of the molecular supply building. In addition, no details are shown for protection of any stockpiles that may be created from the excavation of the store addition. The work being conducted could have an impact on the adjacent coastal resources if the erosion and sedimentation control measures are not properly installed at the correct locations, locations and maintained. Existing plans do not reflect the current site conditions based on current aerial photographs of the property. The boat storage area on the south side of the property has been covered by impervious material as defined by the zoning regulations and has been expanded further to the south. This increase in impervious area needs to be calculated and treated in a stormwater management system. These modifications to the site need to be shown on the site plan to be approved. In order to make sure that coastal resources are protected, I recommend the following additions of approval. Revised plans should be submitted showing additional erosion and sedimentation control measures, stormwater mitigation plans, expanded storage boat area to the south side of the property, and current impervious surface conditions. Two, Town of Guilford Zoning Enforcement Office should be notified to inspect the sedimentation and erosion control measures prior to the site construction. Soil stockpiles should be maintained by silt fencing and or hay bales. Soil erosion and sedimentation control measures shall be maintained until vegetation is established or suitable materials installed to the satisfaction of, the zoning, of zoning enforcement. Three, the Town of Guilford Enforcement Officer should be notified to inspect the roof water infiltration system and an as-built plan showing the infiltration location should be submitted to the zoning enforcement office prior to the issuance of the certificate of zoning compliance. In accordance with stormwater regulations, a stormwater covenant or a stormwater management plan should be filed on the land records. Uh, Mr. Fetus, uh, you mentioned the, a number of the items that the committee noted in this memo here. You uh, you said you're updating your drawings for our next uh, public hearing on this item. And you're going to cover everything that he has in his uh, memo here. Greg, Greg Fettis, uh, Fettis Engineering. Yes, well, we're going to cover uh, the majority of the items on there. Um, I think there's agreement between the town engineer and the planner, the interim planner, that uh, the material that was expanded or put down in the boat storage area is not impervious. Yeah, it's, per it's, it's pervious, so we won't be required to uh, do the stormwater management plan, but we'll work all that out with staff uh, prior to the meeting and hopefully have clean letters from everyone prior to the meeting. Steve? Yeah, I, I agree with Greg's comments. Um, I submitted a memo for the record dated um, June 5th, and I submitted a revised one dated June 7th, which clarifies what Greg just said. Um, I can't attest to. Okay. All right, I'm coming. 
Um, excuse me. Um, Janice, I can attest that Janice Plazak did go out to the site and inspect it. In my original memo, I cited that I thought it was uh, Millings. Uh, Janice has confirmed that it's crushed stone um, and that it should be classified as an impervious surface. And I agree with that assessment. Um, I don't think a stormwater management plan for that uh, particular area should be required at this time. And I think for the most part, Greg has addressed um, or at least uh, spoken about my other fairly minor comments on the application. Uh, Steve, speaking of Janice's memo, was that the only item that she had to discuss? Should we, should we not need to read that one of the record since it's pretty much been covered? Or do you think there's more items that we need to go through on it? I think all of the, the big items were addressed, primarily that she was requesting that infiltrators um, specifications be included for the, the roof leaders for the building and that the um, she she did request a stormwater maintenance plan, but since that time, we've we both agreed that we don't think one should be required for the crushed stone area. She's out of the office today. Safe to say that she's going to review the updated drawing as well. Yes, we'll all provide updated memos. All right. Do we have any other memos that we need to read? In that case, I will read off Steve's memo, which you mentioned earlier. Steve, do we need to meet read yours? Do you feel like you've co we've covered your memo as well? I think you've you've covered the bulk of the items on there. Okay. All right. So, any further questions from commissioners? Um, as as you've heard, this is definitely going to be going to a second uh, public hearing. This is a special permit. But if you are here to to ask questions or speak about this application, now is the time. First, we'll uh, ask anyone who has if anyone has any questions for the applicant uh, to raise your hand here or online. Uh, so seeing none for questions, we'll ask if anyone would like to speak in um, support of this application, uh, either raise your hand here or online and you can have your time. Would anyone want to speak in uh, opposition to this application? All right, seeing no further discussion, commissioners, I'd entertain a motion to continue this to our um, May 17th meeting, I'm sorry, June 21st meeting. A vote. Thank you, Phil. Second. Second from Larry. Uh, Larry Rizzolo. Yes. Kevin Clark. Yes. Ted Sands. Yes. Bill Freeman. Yes. Bill Johnson. Yes. Todd Cosgrove. Aye. And I uh, will, yes. We'll see you at our next meeting. Thank you, Craig. Uh, next item on our agenda, Al Secondino, A Secondino and Son, Inc., 441 Boston Street, that 48, Lot 52, Zone R3, Special Permit and Culture Site Plan for an addition connecting the two buildings of existing daycare visits following variance approval. I'm Freddie Cristola Engineering, representing the owner and applicant, 441 Boston Street. Uh, only ever been to one other hybrid meeting before. Sure. Quite honestly, it was a disaster. I don't know where you want me to set up. So the camera's here. Um, if you, but we can bring up what you're showing online as well. So if you wanted to put it up there so everybody here in the audience can see you, sure. that'd be great. And then uh, the only other thing with this microphone is just project. So you may have to come on this side for us to hear him well. Yeah, the microphone is over here, so if you can project oh, from there, yeah. that's fine. Or if you feel like you need to move closer to the mic, you can do that. Okay. Uh, as I said, um, uh, Jim Freddy with Cruise Call Engineering. Uh, this property is located at the corner of Lost Street and Sound View Road. It was at some point in time two properties that were, have been since merged. Um, there is existing on the property um, two buildings that are. Um, Currently run as a daycare uh, by a special exception of August of 1978. Uh, and then there is a house here that is currently occupied by the tenant. The property is accessed from uh, the, the, the daycare part of the property is accessed from Sound Road. Um, there is parking for teachers here, drop off area, and then there's a ladder with her access to. 
Proposal is to add an addition, and, and these are both single story uh, buildings on this lap. The proposal is to add a uh, connecting building, um, also a single story on a slab, um, so that uh, it will expand the daycare use and allow movement of the children within the building um, from different areas um, that exist in the new areas inside and on a weather provides like uh, you know, additional safety. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have provided um, for the expansion of the teaching staff. Uh, there will be you, you folks don't really have a, a very specific parking requirement for daycare, uh, but so we have provided um, ample parking for the projected teacher um, increase and. Also, a um, number of spaces again for drop off, which are five minute parking spaces and pick up drop off. Um, we have also uh, provided fenced in, separated fenced in play yard areas, um, along with our turf, uh, some with uh, wood chip areas. Um, we have provided a rain garden element here, sort of landscape in the front of this existing building, um, but it, it, it's for the increase that the new roof is going to present to the site. Um, there was a, a number of um, staff comments that we received in the last few days of one of uh, the health department tonight about that. So we haven't addressed those concerns. I think they're minor. Um, the majority of the concerns are centered around uh, landscaping uh, and lighting. Uh, we have not provided a uh, lighting plan yet, but um, currently there isn't any lighting in the parking lot. Yeah, always don't really suggest the need for it. But what they do have, uh, what we are doing is adding a wall pack uh, unit above the door of the entrance door uh, access to the parking lot. Um, I did add the cut sheet for that onto the detail sheet. Um, we did provide, I don't know. If, yeah, the, I, did, I did send you the plans earlier today. And they brought up the 24 hour thing. Um, so, this is um, our landscaping plan. There were a couple of trees that were omitted from the original plan. Um, so, there are some mature trees here. This mature tree that actually they're intending and saving. Um, so I do have to set the tent, but um, there are some various trees. There was two new trees planted by the town recently when the sidewalks were installed. Um, we're going to add another one <laughs> similar to that here, kind of continue that theme and then here. Um, we are adding some landscaping again along the front of the new building, uh, which will be viewed from Sandy Road. Um, and again, the, the rain garden area will be kind of the buffer of the landing for the existing building that's there. Uh, we do have plans by the architect, um, Tom Edwards, and that we also included floor plans and elevations. Uh, you can see this is this is the view from the from Sandy Road. This is the existing building and the connector. This is the new building. We're not scale wise, we're not increasing the height of the structures on the site at all. There is a step. If you're looking from the parking lot area, the existing building is a little bit lower. So there is a step in the roof line in that direction. Um, but overall, we're not increasing the height. Did include also in the uh, <coughs> email this morning, and I can give you but uh, uh, bright and early here is going to be uh, taking this over, and they have a number of other facilities. Um, we have a typical what their typical play yard looks like, 
on just the other on screen there now, but just to give you a sense for what that element is going to look like. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I apologize. I don't have the name of the gentleman making the presentation. How many additional daycare slots are going to be made available to our community as a result of this proposal? License is going to end up being 120, and they have 50 now. So, so we go into the roll up, we're going from 50 to 120. The, the increase of 70, which potential. is a which, which fulfills a substantial need in our community, um, if I'm not mistaken. Is that why this proposal is coming forward? Correct. There's a, um, uh, especially from the, the medical buildings close by here, there's very high demand in this area. Does anyone or do you have any idea of how many uh, slots are actually needed to satisfy the need in our community? Overall throughout the town? Yeah. Uh, I, I believe it's substantial, but I don't know. Um, I run a ratio for every, uh, my name is April Lukasik. I'm the owner of the Bright and Early Child Care Center chain. And I run a, a demographic study to see how many slots um, are needed in any particular town. And I base it on the amount of children that are under the age of five and also under the age of three. So it will speak to infant toddler as well as preschool. And I've come up with a formula that's a ratio and Guilford probably needs closer to 200, I would say. So I'm trying to tap into a you know, a good portion of it, but it, it, the need seems to be based on the amount of license slots right now and how many children are in that demographic. Thank you for that answer. Thanks. Um, Steve Danik, do you have any, anything you want to go over for this application? Yeah, I, I put together a memo and I think the applicant addressed a couple items, but I just wanted to share my review comments briefly and maybe the applicant can address some of them um, and if he did revise the plan share how how they were incorporated um, number one was the site parking uh, the proposed parking layout that was shown on the plan floor plans and elevation sheet a1 drawn by nelson and edwards stated 5-4 does not match the site plan for proposed site plan for addition page two of two of three Drawn by Chris Kulo Engineering, dated 5-3-23. Um, there, there appears to be stacked parking on the on the layout of the site plan, and there's a different orientation for the uh, architectural plan, so they don't seem to be speaking to each other. Secondly, the site plan does not identify site parking. Uh, it doesn't include any kind of parking count other than those spaces which are included in front of the building addition. And it appears that there may be a shared parking arrangement and an easement between number 441 Boston Street and number 421 Boston Street. And I'd like some clarification on this. Um, and I think the plan should be revised to include a total parking count. Um, now on that on that note as well, um, it seems to be a, a pretty significant addition to the building um, and not a lot of parking is being added. So I think it's worth exploring how many employees are going to be uh, on the property at one time to make sure there is adequate parking. Um, the app, the applicant did state that the use is not listed in the parking chart and I don't believe it is. Um, but I think the commission should ensure that there's enough parking spaces on the site for the employees that are going to be added. Um, comments two through five on my memo. Um, the site plan was not stamped. It looks like the new one that was just being shared is. Um, number three, there was no landscape plan that's required by zoning regulations, section 75M. Looks like that may have been added here at, at the uh, new plan set. Um, there is no lighting plan in accordance with section 75O. Uh, they should be revised to include one. And I would recommend um, that the design plan be reviewed by the design advisory committee and that building elevations sh should show some additional detail to ensure that the new addition is going to match what the existing building is. Uh, can I make a quick 
So go ahead, Phil. So, you know, we're, we're going from 60 students to 130. That's the, I, mean, I, I, have no desire, I have no doubt there's significant demand, but you know, my wife works at a you know, pre-K through eight school, and it's not the daytime parking that's the issue. It's the pickup and drop off. And it seems completely inadequate to have that number of students getting dropped off and picked up with teacher parking and no turnaround plan, no design plan for a, you know, a drop off circle, whatever that might be. Um, it just, it looks like a formula for a parking disaster. Um, would you like to speak to your timing in terms of a pick up and drop off? Sure. Because it is different you know from, from K through eight. No, it, yeah. it all depends. I mean, like, you know, some little kids might get picked up at noon, but you know, yeah. full day kids that are going to be there from 7.30 to 3.30, 4.30. But there's always going to be a crunch at, you know, whatever the pickup times usually are. I mean, it's not, yeah. it's not, it's not a random, it's usually not a random set of drop-offs and pickups. It's usually pretty well orchestrated as to what time programming would start and then what time it would end. Right. So we'll be, ex I'll be expanding the hours to um, 6.30 to 6 and the drop-offs will start uh, 6 30 in the morning and they will typically end by about nine o'clock so you have three and uh, you know 7 30 8 30 two and a half hours and and they will start to be picked up at four to six so you've got two solid hours at the end of the day so and they are in very quick I mean I just have a center in Southbury that has about the same parking and the same license it, it actually flows very well and I have not this is my ninth school so it is comparable to other schools that I have already. And we just built one in Middlebury and it has, you know, the one row of parking and there's some up the side. So it actually reminds me of this and with the expanded hours and also a lot of children are siblings. So even though it may sound like this many more children, there, there may be one parent picking up two and sometimes even three children. So it, it's, um, I, I believe that number of parking should be am, will be ample. Yeah, um, Phil, they will take a look at the parking certainly based off of Steve's comments. Um, I can also attest that with my two kids that are in daycare, there's a max of three other parents, maybe three mother parents there whenever I go to pick up or drop off. Um, it is not the crux that you see at the elementary school. Sure. How do you get into and out of the parking lot? Could you enter one way and leave another? I'm <clears throat> thinking about this floor program. Well, the way it's been existing for 40 years, they do come in and out of the same entrance. So that's what has been working there for all of this time. So I would imagine it would continue to work well. There's lots of turnaround space at the end where it's the shared um, pavement between the two buildings, which has almost no cars in it. And so if, you know, a parent, they shouldn't end up bottlenecked there. And if they do need to pull out and turn around, there's plenty of space at the other end. And so the one entrance exit seems will be fine. And can you show us on the map where that is? So there is uh, an overwide driveway that comes from here that also applies that. There's a very huge payment area. There are reciprocal accesses in the property. Um, Steve mentioned the cost of shared parking. I didn't find any of that. There are, there are certainly access easements that are shared. Between the so, um, but again, this is, this driveway is fairly wide. So, uh, you know, cars come in, pick up, and then they pull back up. Exit to Soundview, or other Soundview, where there is only a blinking light. Right on the corner. Yes. 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 Problem. Okay. Any other questions from commissioners? What causes sensitive teeth? Did you know that the two leading causes of irritated gums and weak enamel switch to new sets of sensitivity gum enamel? I'll take care of three problems. Just one toothpaste. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Good question. 
Um, I know you mentioned the two other facilities that your your um, company operates. What what are the employee counts on on those businesses and 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 the student counts and how many parking spaces are you utilizing right now? I mean, I, I'll do some homework on this on on our end, but I'm curious to know. Um, in my Middletown Center, I believe I have 35 spaces. Um, I have eight other centers, not two, eight. This will be number nine. Um, and in Middlebury, do you remember? We just, we just built out Middlebury. Um, I think there are 16 teachers full. There are 20 spaces. So 36 is usually 35 as an average is very comfortable for any of my locations. And some of my locations have 160 kids like down in Niantic. Um, sure. I, what I'm trying to understand is the specific size of those facilities and how it correlates with the parking. I, I understand that there may be a general size or, or different. Yeah, I don't have that exact data for you. I certainly okay. I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay. But that's information you can get. Yeah. And is there a shared parking arrangement or is it just a, a access easement? I did not find on record any shared parking agreement. Um, but but I did find the access agreement, so uh, okay. access agreements. So I don't I'm not sure exactly where that came from, but uh, that's a question that I had because I saw the easement and I saw a very connected parking lot. Thank you. Any other questions for the public in a moment? Um, do we have any uh, town staff members that need to redirect the person? While he's bringing that up, any other questions from commissioners? I would just mention that when you're doing your lighting plan, um, take a look at the regs. They're typically full cutoffs for certain um, day values and all that. So we did have uh, this wall pack that we had store. We did add this full cutoff for 3,000 K. Okay. Since we already went over Stu's memo as the principal player, I'll start with Kevin's as the environment. Okay. Um, Larry, do you want to take this one? Um, sure. To Guilford Planning and Zoning Commission from Kevin McGee, Environment Planner, RE Coastal Site Plan and Special Permit, 441 Broadway Street, Guilford, Connecticut, 06437. Assessor map 48, lot 52. The applicant plans on constructing a 5,380 square foot addition to connect the two, uh, to connect the two, uh, the existing daycare buildings. The proposed stormwater management practices will be, will consist of roof leaders from the addition, uh, discharging to a rain garden. Property is located in the coastal area uh, management area. The coastal resource policies applicable for the property are throwlands and flood hazard area. Plans for the project have sedimentation and erosion control procedures that are in that are in compliant with 7273-97B subsection 6 of the zoning regulations. No planting plan was submitted as part of the application to show the number and type of plants to be uh, planted in the rain garden. In addition, the plants show a number of mature trees being removed from the property. New trees should be uh, planted along Soundview Road and between the parking lot and the playgrounds. Robin. I recommend the following conditions of approval in order to- What is she going to do? I can hop on no. it. No lighting plan was included in the application. Exterior lighting should be dark spy compliant with the cooler temperature of light fixtures should be no greater than 3000 K. The planting plan should be submitted detailing the number and type of plants being installed in the rain garden. In addition, the planting plan should show the replanting of trees along Foundry Road and between the parking lot and the playground. Three, the town of Guilford zoning enforcement officer shall be notified to inspect the sedimentation and erosion control measures prior to any site work. Soil stockpiles should be contained by silt fencing and or hay bales. Soil erosion and sedimentation control measures shall be maintained until vegetation is established 
or suitable material is installed to the satisfaction of the zoning enforcement. <clears throat> Four, to assure compliance of the stormwater management system in accordance to section 273-75.F of the zoning code, the applicant shall file a maintenance covenant on the land records as required by section 273-75.F, stormwater management subsection seven, um, parentheses, maintenance uh, uh, covenants, close parentheses, of the town of Guilford zoning code. The maintenance covenant shall be written uh, and operation manual for all stormwater management systems located at the subject site. The manual should provide uh, provisions for yearly inspection, maintenance of the stormwater system, and yearly reports to the town engineer. The maintenance schedule should include, uh, but not be limited to weekly, monthly, and quarterly inspections of the property for litter, monitoring the dumpster and outside storage areas, monitoring of the catch basins and maintenance of the rain garden. The maintenance plan needs to provide a statement that the stormwater management plan uh, will be reviewed annually so that inspection slash maintenance requirements uh, that any changes to the plan would require the approval of the town engineer. And quote, as of built, uh, sorry, and quote, as built drawing uh, close close of the completed stormwater system um, prepared in accordance with section 273-75.f stormwater management subsection six Brenton's uh, construction close parentheses. Great. Uh, we covered some of those items already. Uh, sorry to move forward with all those stipulations in the next update. Right. Um, do we have one for the help? Um, you feel like you know. Yeah, you can make it a little bigger on the screen. Right here. You okay. Uh, to the and Commission from Shirley Mickens, RS, uh, dated June 7th, 2023, 3441 Boston Street, Map 48 Lot Edition. An engineer plan was submitted to the health department for an addition at the above address. The health department will be working with the Connecticut Office of Early Childhood and Cradle to Crayons to increase the number of students. The proposed engineering plan addition involves the installation of two new subsurface sewage disposal systems to accommodate the increase in use. The engineer plan will be approved pending additional soil testing. The past soil testing indicated predominantly sand and gravel with good infiltration capability capacity. So the health department sees no substantial change to the plan. Any changes made to the engineer plan will need to be submitted to the health department for review of Shirley Eggers. RS. Engineering or that's it, correct? So engineering, we already agreed to cover. Uh, we have to cover it. All right. In that case, I will bring it up. And that'll be the last one. Two planning and zoning commission from the last three the iconic mayor, RE 441 Boston Street. The project includes a rain garden with a new roof area, stormwater management. This is the only landscaping improvement shown for the entire site. This site will have all remaining trees removed and never to replace them. The site is on a prominent corner and on a state scenic highway, which is 146. And in the past couple of years, trees on the property along Boston Street were cut down, now the stumps remain. As part of the recent sidewalk project, the town planted two maple trees along the Boston Street frontage, but a project of this site should include a landscape land, including new trees, and removal of remaining stumps. The rain garden discharge pipe shown to connect to the town's catch basin in the road will require a permit from the engineering department prior to the start. Yeah, you handled some of that already uh, from your presentation. Uh, yep, understood. 
Okay. And with the bigger tree in the corner, you said you had to relocate the uh, septic system. Did I hear that right? Uh, well, the tank tree. The real tank tree. Tank tree. The tank too close to the existing tree. Yeah, too, not too close to it. Yeah. Where would you move it? <clears throat> After we remove it under it could be just try to get it out of the root system. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Any other questions from commissioners? Yes, Mr. Johnson. You're muted. Has there been any type of a traffic study done on the current volume versus the proposed volume? There is not a traffic study. There is not a traffic study. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, if we have no more questions for commissioners, we'll ask for a question from the public. Over there, uh, just one, one information. Um, I know when parents are dropping off and picking up children, uh, safety can be an issue. Just uh, you know, so to make sure the parking is arranged so that the teachers are in one area and you're not going to have uh, an issue with the parents in a hurry coming in, children going across the parking lot. I'm sorry, can I have your name? I'm Charlie McClure. Charlie. So in all of the centers, I always have the teachers park the farthest away so that parents can park right in front, especially uh, mothers and fathers with car seats so that they can bring them right in. And I agree with you completely. I don't want any two-year-olds, three-year-olds, one-year-olds running across a parking lot, which is why we also put the playgrounds right up against so that when they leave the school to go to the playground, they're entering directly, you know, into the safe area. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, the staff is always parked the furthest away and leaving as many spots available for parents as possible. Any other questions from the public? Uh, would anyone like to speak in support of this application? Does anyone like to speak in opposition to this application? Question, if you don't mind. Question, Actually, my question is uh, my fellow member, uh, Phil. Did you bring up the idea of a traffic study to, because you'd like to see one or you'd like to have a discussion about that? How would, how would that get prompted if, if we wanted such a study? Honestly, I'm just um, concerned that the there's not a massive expansion of the parking in relation to the expansion of staff and mm -hmm. students. And, you know, what is the current, you know, traffic flow look like? And then again, projecting that forward based upon increased student and staffing, what does that look like? You know, I just, again, it's not like there's a turnaround circle and you're dropping kids off in a specific area. They're, Define parking spaces. And so I think it, I mean, I, I wish I could see the future, but I mean, it just sounds to me like it's going to be a congestion nightmare for parents. And a, a problem, I mean, they have not exponentially expanded the size of the parking the way they've done with the capacity of the buildings. I would say that um, a turnaround when there is a horseshoe is my least favorite parking situation because somebody comes in and they want to leave and they're coming out and a parent's getting out of the car. I think that's the most dangerous is when you have like a U shape where parents are getting out and you know if a child gets out the wrong side of the car, they're in the line of traffic. So I actually prefer for safety to have them lined up like this. I think all my centers are actually lined up this way. Um, the other thing I would say is I know that the square footage of the building connecting looks large, it does. There's a gym in there, which actually 
doesn't increase the amount of children. It's not licensed for a classroom, it's licensed for a gym. So the children from the existing two buildings have the opportunity to go into a gym or a meditation room or a dance room, things like that. So some of the space in there is just expanding the curriculum experience for the children. And there's also a whole reception hub in there as well. And as far as the amount of staff that are getting increased, we're putting the preschool children there. And so it's one teacher to you know, 10 students. And so you're really only looking at seven extra teachers. And they will also um, be on a schedule where some come in at 6.30 and some come in at nine. So it's not seven parking spaces all at once. So it, it, to me, it looks a little deceiving, like, wow, that's a lot of space. How are you gonna handle the parking that would line up with that amount of square footage? But there are some components that make it less than sort of the visual impact. I would like something provided by the, the applicants that, it, that explains how many employees are going to be on the site, how many were existing in, in the current configuration, how many students are you going to be having, uh, what, what are your other sites projecting um, based on their size, and, and what does the ITE say about parking counts for daycares? Because um, I haven't heard any, any actual numbers about this. I think the points you've made about the horseshoe are very reasonable, but I think there's some additional information that needs to be provided here. Else that would like to, to, to come in this meeting? All right. Uh, so I see that we have a question from Matt Howie. Great. Mr. Howie, here's your hand still up. What's yours? Let me unmute. Um, I, I will once again, and, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here. I would urge the applicant to satisfy the concerns that the board has relative to the parking uh, for the simple reason that there is a significant shortage of daycare slots available in our community. In fact, I've had uh, substantial conversations with uh, Liza Petra from the Guilford Foundation about how we might be able to direct uh, American Rescue Plan funds to assist in the uh, uh, support and development of daycare slots for the community members. So. Um, I, I would urge the applicants to uh, work with the board, uh, with the commission, and uh, to satisfy the concerns, because uh, this is a desperate need in our community, and if this is an opportunity to service our community, um, uh, we, we should make every effort we can to make sure it happens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I see Ellen Coyle, let's just raise your hand. So, sure. Ellen, will you speak? Yes. Um, I am a, uh, a great aunt of one of the students that is at the center right now. And mm -hmm. when I go and pick up the student, um, every parking place is taken already. And that's with the number being at 50. So I don't understand if they're not changing the size of the parking lot, how can you have enough parking for 120 students? That's my statement. So, may I respond? So two things about that. With the expanded hours, everything is gonna get diluted um, and the staffing that they have right now um, is not gonna be the same staffing model that we use. Um, the, the absentee owner, and I've been working with him on staffing for a few weeks now, he's, he's been struggling and I've been helping him. He's had like two teachers in a room with eight children when there should be you know, one with 10. And you know, with a degree teacher who is you know, educated in curriculum and, and that type of thing. So I think with the expanded hours, that's gonna really stretch out the um, amount of spaces. And while the staff right now is really full, more full than it should be, it will increase, but it won't, it won't increase on what it is right now. It's almost like one and a half times versus doubling it or anything like that. Please. Anything else from Alan? Okay. 
All right. I'm going to turn a motion from commissioners to continue uh, this to our uh, July 21st meeting. So uh, I'm sorry, June 21st. June 21st. Uh, June 21st. Uh, there was a recommendation from Steve going to the yeah. Uh, is it a recommendation? Is that so just uh, have a conversation with Steve okay. if um, if they have a meeting that you can. It was on the last month. Sorry, last month. Right. So just have a conversation with Steve. Yes. Right. Uh, so I have a motion from Ted. Do I have a second? <coughs> second. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Larry Dillon. Yes. Kevin Clark. Yes. Ted Sandler. Yes. Yes. Bill Johnson. Yes. Frank Osborne. He's out of town. One vote. It abstains. Uh, oh, yes. I guess it's going to sit to our next meeting. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Next item on our agenda is Town of Gilbert Planning and Zoning Commission application for adoption of proposed April 13, 2023 draft zoning regulations and amended zoning map. It's continued from our May 17th meeting. Um, what I'm going to start. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Just wanted the commission members to know that uh, with the uh, staff and I have been working on a great <clears throat> exhibit list of all of the correspondence that has come in. We're going to use this to refer to documents, make sure that the commission member will share this with you at the appropriate time. Make sure you have all of the materials in the record. We'll also be using this as a foundation to put the comments together, the comment list, if you will. Uh, sometimes some of the correspondence or testimony that's been submitted it covers multiple topics, so we're going to have to break it up and reorganize it, etc. So I just want you to know that we're monitoring all the stuff that's coming in, keeping track of all, etc., uh, to try to make your job easier uh, when the time comes. <clears throat> I think we did notice as part of the uh, work and review on the regulations that there may be two additional issues that I would like to bring to your attention. One of those is related to a statutory change related to EV chargers. In our regulations as crafted right now today, it says that you have to install a station. The statute requires a commission uh, as a result of the addition of 30 or more spaces to establish the infrastructure. And the difference is the station is the actual charger on the ground, whereas the infrastructure is the conduits, panel capacity, wiring, et cetera, but the, the, the charger doesn't have to be installed. So it's just something that we want to bring to your attention and ask if you want to stay with what's in the regulation or follow the statute. That will happen. There was also a conversation with Jamie before she left with regard to the density standards for the conservation development. And so we'll be taking another look at that. And so you may see something from me in the comments, um, if you will, um, just raising this issue for your further deliberations uh, once we make sure we track down all the correspondence. Thank you. Um, just a couple items uh, before we move to public comments on it, just the, the general process. Uh, this is the public hearing for this item. I don't expect us to get to 1030, but there is a hard cap at 1030 for public comment on this item. Um, and the other thing I'll mention is just to kind of reiterate the process. We had a public hearing um, two or three weeks ago. Uh, we'll reflect the comments. We've been collecting comments on a website, um, on the town website. You can um, access that comments website. Um, and we'll collect all comments from tonight's meeting as well. All those are going on the, on the spreadsheet that Glenn just mentioned. Um, once the public hearing is closed, uh, whenever that happens, uh, we expect the next meeting will be presented by Glenn, that full list of comments to go through. Um, and however long that process takes, uh, we'll be doing that and making sure we've gone through all the comments uh, before we make it soon. So uh, with that said, we'll, we'll go through, uh, open it up for public uh, comments. Um, similar to what we did at the last public hearing, you know, this is more of you presenting your comment about um, about the regulations to us and to Glenn. Um, so if you have general comments, that's great. If you have specific ones, just uh, try to speak to which which section uh, you're, you're speaking to. Um, other than that, I'll, I'll 
Um, so if you go to the uh, web page where comments are listed, you'll see a, a handful of comments that don't seem all that many. Um, uh, but if you read the fine print to the uh, left of that, uh, we couldn't fit all the comments in that place, but there's a link that takes you to the complete set of comments. So if you might have uh, overlooked that, there is a link that gets you to 100% of the comments. That's a great point. Thank you, Larry. Um, any other any other items from commissioners before we open up the public comments? All right. Um, pull somebody from here in the room. Again, please um, state your name and address for the record. And the microphone was up here. So if you feel like you can't project, then maybe you can come and sit in the front seat here. Um, you can start and go down. So. Uh, Christy, do you want to see? Yeah, yes. Um, I I have something to read. Do we have a three minute window? Um, yes, three uh, minutes. Okay. Christy Rubin Dunst, uh, two twenty one, Mitchell Road, North Guilford, Connecticut. And um, I'd like to introduce myself as both the private citizen living in president of North Guilford, um, but I've also been an active member on the Affordable Housing Committee since its inception in September of 2014. Um, that's other people here. So, um, and I am in favor of adopting the, the present um, proposed p and plans as they are, because I feel we have a strong commitment from the town to support um, living with them for a while and, and testing them in the waters and, and being able to review and amend them as we come up against a lot of nights or obstacles or things that really seem to be changed. So I support, I support them, the adoption as they are with um, what I would call some clarifications and two clarifications um, that I would like to make um, are addressed and are stated in the uh, sections 11, uh, six, sorry, 611B1 uh, and 611B2, uh, which address um, the question about affordable housing units as defined by the state of Connecticut, which are deed restricted units. And um, we've proposed in the, in the regulations that uh, two or more dwelling units be included um, uh, as uh, the provision for affordable housing use, the basis for that. Um, and then we get to how this percentage of uh, what percent are we going to require of um, the developer to provide affordable housing. And that has been batted around between 10 and 20%. And it is included in the, in the proposal at 12%. And this uh, percentage seems reasonable. And, uh, to the people that I've talked to and the research that I've done to try to come up with, with a good, um, you know, solution. Um, so 12%, I feel, is not unreasonable. It's far lower than the 20% in the incentive zones, which are still preserved. The affordable housing is not impacted in the, in the um, incentive zones. Um, it does not impinge on units per acre limitations of other zones. And what it does uh, mirror or parallel is the adjustments to density limitations that a developer may achieve by dedicating, for instance, land to the conservation um, trust, land trust. Um, so in terms of the percentage required, 12%, um, is a little bit more than what some developers may have, you know, they may be going like, oh, 10%, but um, with only a 10% uh, 
uh, inclusion, our progress toward the state's, uh, toward our belief in doing what's right, and the state's goal of 10% every time we build a new market rate unit, even if it's a single uh, once-off private family building a house on these four acres, that erodes our, our um, progress toward a goal of even 10%. So uh, we've experienced that in the past um, few months when we saw our uh, achieved uh, affordable housing at 2.8% drop down to 2.1% it was. Um, I'd also like to address this general fear that uh, having a percentage of 12% uh, affordable housing will scare developers off, but when I've talked with um, the, the town consultants, um, yes, thank you, please meet you, and um, with uh, um, developers that I was referred to, um, that, that this 12% uh, has not seemed ultimately unreasonable if I could characterize our conversation that way. Um, we have written into the into that 6.11 section um, options that incentivize developers, including things like some flexibility, like building affordable housing on site, building it off site, um, or having an option to pay a fee in lieu. Which gets me to the next portion that I know the commissioners had. Um, some concerns about uh, which is how how do we calculate a fee in lieu? And after a lot of conversation, both within our group and um, on the sidebar with MJ here um, and talking with the other people I've uh, mentioned, um, it seems that uh, mm. this helps ameliorate the the, the feeling of being onerous that like you have to build something or you have to um, you know pay an enormous mm -hmm. fee and we have calculation um, in the regulations as they're presently written it's based on um, I think the wording has construct is const a construction fee but um, after hearing some of the feedback from the conversations I've had um, MJ and I came up with this idea to tie it to um, the square footage uh, calculations that are already existing in the in in the plan for uh, the permitting fee schedule. So if I can just you know, point that out. Um, so the, sorry. I, to do this, but if we tie it to this number, which is um, part of their the, the permitting fee calculation, then um, and we take the twelve percent of that, so that's a per unit. And then there's I, I could go into more detail about how um, you know that would be applied for multifamily where there might be shared common spaces. All of these can write it up. Oh, 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 when can I do that? Yeah. <laughs> just write it up. Okay. Okay. So just as a point of clarification, you're, you're speaking on behalf of the Affordable Housing Committee? I am speaking as myself, who is a very Okay. member of the affordable <laughs> housing committee and we haven't actually met on this specific uh to this specific detail level at this point because everything is time compressed so um i spoke with spoken with larry and mj and matt hoey and uh, um, it just sounds like a statement that's coming from the committee, which it, is perfectly fine. I just think it needs to be clarified. No, but. no, it's it's me, but I am also disclosing that I'm on okay. the committee and um, doing this uh, out of my passion for the affordable housing cause, if you will. Yes. 
Right. Um, also, notice that anyone that's on the Zoom call, go ahead and raise your hand. If you have, if you'd like to speak, and we'll bounce back and forth between um, here in person as well as online. Um, I haven't seen any hand raised on online yet, though, so we'll go to the next person on the list here. And so, Mary. I've seen you over here. Is that, is this, is that yeah, right here is better. Hi, my name is Mary Jo Kester, 131 Boston Street. Um, I'm also a partner at Campaign Kester Artists. We have 15 active projects at Guilford in various stages of construction, and we do zoning reviews for all of them. Um, my partner is Russell Campaign, who has written a number of individual memos on topics that I tend to agree with, but I wanted to come tonight and um, speak um, for myself as well. Um, I've been involved in town planning since 2003. I was on the planning committee from 2003 until 2015. 2004, I worked with Glenn Shoulder on our growth management strategy. That's my favorite theaters. Okay. Yeah, okay. And we, uh, we won an award for that, though. Um, and then in 2009 to 2015, I co-chaired the Plan of Conservation and Development Committee with Shelley Green um, to do the update on that. And that took us you know, six years, which was not what we thought it was going to take. But in terms of trying to balance conservation and development, essential town character, and set a clear set of goals to gather public input, that's, that's what it took. So I appreciate what you're doing here tonight, because I know it's been a long haul. And um, I think that's, that's just how it is. Um, since 2014, I've been on the um, Housing for Economic and Development Plan Committee, also known as the Affordable Housing Committee, with um, Christine Rubin Dunstan. Now we have several members of PNC join us, which we're delighted about. And as you heard, we're still passionate about trying to um, find ways to do affordable housing in town. Um, I'd like to stress here that the only thing we are not making more of is land and that we need to be very deliberate about how we develop and protect it. Um, and to this point, I feel like there has not been adequate review or public comment for the topics that have come up between the December draft that were pending in April when we said, we're just gonna include them, which includes affordable housing, conservation subdivisions, and stormwater management. Um, I've heard multiple times that perfect is the enemy of the good, but I just want to say I think that is a context dependent phrase that in medicine, engineering, and aviation, we would not accept that. And land use is an experiment that is not easily changed. This update needs to seriously consider both our undeveloped land and proposed development's impacts as having significant benefits and costs that are directly affected by this code. Um, the move fast and break things motto should, should not be what we're trying to do here with the planning and zoning code. Um, specific to housing, I'm in favor of housing, but I do not think these regulations will encourage it. I think 12% um, is too much if a developer can just move to Brantford or Madison. We just had the state you know, deliberate on the fair share. I don't know how much you guys have been following that, but that ended up not passing the TOD. I think it's gonna get kicked to the next time either. And I hope that's something our housing committee can continue to study. But also I'm still confused about how we calculate the fee in lieu of. <laughs> and um, Christy and I have been working on something that I think is good, but I think you really you know, need to, to know that stuff then. Um, I was glad to hear about the update on how um, public comments are gonna be um, consolidated and <laughs> considered. Um, I'm looking forward to that. And um, I, I would love it if when you deliberate, you, you did give some uh, verbalization to the intent of some of the changes, such as proportionality of open space, the change in the sum of side setback calculations, the projections for setbacks, parking, goals for the rezoning of Route 1, and the massive bulk changes from FAR to human square footage. The, the, the bulk is, is really what the net of that is. Um, and I also just wanted to say, I, I think for me, because I use this code all the time, people have approached me and asked for 
sort of clarification because it's very hard to engage with this material if you're not familiar with it. And I, I'm sure you guys have heard this too, that people are not used to you know, zoning and oh, they want to be involved. It's, it's kind of difficult to read. And so I, I do hope that there might be you know, another effort just to clarify the goals and intentions of the major changes. We try to keep that to three minutes, but I, I also need more about this that maybe I would write down. <laughs> We also have Alan. Is Alan Walker still here? No. Um, Michael Scott. Uh, thank you very much. Michael Scott, 593 Matana Swamp Road. I'm a licensed architect. I have degrees in architecture and urban design. Sat on Guilford Planning and Zoning. I used to sit on uh, Guilford uh, Zoning Subcommittee. Um, good evening. Thank you for taking my comments again. I'm gravely concerned about the decision uh, before the town. Um, do the members of this commission understand the proposed zoning code's impact on your own properties in Guilford? And so, do you understand the impact on your neighbors' properties? Um, I would ask you that until you do, uh, I don't see how you can personally commend. Um, or recommend uh, for their adoption. I looked into this zoning code's impact on my neighbor's parcel, the former Sullivan Orchard property, scheduled to be rezoned MUV. Um, the Sullivan parcel is 150, 105 acres or uh, 4.6 million square feet. If adopted, the following projects could arrive before the commission simply as a site plan approval a 1,150,000 square foot retail building with another 700,000 square feet of parking. This building could also, as a simple site plan application, be a clinic, office building, or any combination of the other 20 uses approvable by site plan. 1.1 million square feet is five Guilford High Schools, or a shopping mall the width of the town green, stretching from the rear wall of CVS on Route 1 to the rear wall of Page's hardware store. You might think that the Sullivan Orchard parcel is large enough with plenty of space, but this 1.1 million square foot building, according to the bulk standards, can be within 75 feet of its property line and 50 feet off of my road. 50 feet is less than two of these rooms. Four stories, 1.1 million square feet simply by site plan approval. More importantly, that 1.1 million square, feet, square foot building could be 600 dwelling units by site plan permit. There is no place on that parcel, even as large as it is, that 600 dwelling units can exist without affecting my and my neighbor's property, Route 1 traffic, and most of this community's experience of the West End of Guilford. Now, by special permit, because the parcel is within a quarter mile of a bus route, it can qualify for the IHD incentive. Sadly, to the prospective developer, if they tried to maximize to the 20 units per acre, they'd be left with 2,000 units of a poultry 430 square feet each. Affordable, but not necessarily marketable. Nevertheless, to motivate a developer, 1,000 units of 1,100 square feet is achievable by special permit. The current zoning, MUC1, allows for a maximum building area of 100,000 square feet, less than one tenth of what, you're what these codes <laughs> propose. With MUC1, all housing, all housing is by special permit and is age restricted. And I would say that those are important governors on parcels uh, as um, <laughs> specific as the Sullivan Orchard. Uh, your consultant may tell you that these projects still have to go past design advisory. And while I respect that Guilford board and the work that they do, their purview, especially on site plans, is extremely limited. Your town staff might tell you that 1.1 million square feet of buildings and densities of 10 units per acre are nearly impossible to execute in Guilford with our sewer avoidance policy. But that is using a temporary engineering problem to establish and protect our town's land use policy. In my 27 years of practicing architecture, I know how quickly engineering changes, especially in septic design. 
you might tell me that it still has to pass site plan permit but that's not necessarily a public hearing and i have sat on your side of the table and felt the scarcity of arrows in my quiver when presented with a poorly conceived plan last meeting this commission stated that these codes once adopted can be easily tweaked and adjusted and frankly i do agree however once adopted a site plan application or something worse will will arrive before you before you understand how woefully conceived this rezoning is i've seen no evidence of our town staff or our consultant running an analysis of this code's impact on the built environment in our community be it a physical plan or a gis based analysis i am probably overly pessimistic about what will happen on this Sullivan parcel that property has been underused for decades However, maybe some developer buys up four contiguous parcels on Whitfield or Fair Street and erects a four-story 40-unit apartment building visible from the green. Maybe it's your neighbor's parcel, and maybe your neighbor will plant a nice buffer for you on your property line. Years of efforts have gone into this new zoning code. I'm sorry that you are asked to endorse it. No one has, take, uh, no one has taken it out for a test drive before you are asked to operate, operate it at highway speeds. If they have, let's see that effort to determine whether it represents the thoughtful solution to density and affordable housing that Guilford deserves. Until you can answer definitively that you know what is in this code for you and your neighbors and for me and my neighbors, please do not put your name behind it. <laughs> Is there anyone else here who wanted to speak with name? This is okay. I'm, I wrote at the bottom. I didn't realize I had it. Okay, John Newman. Yes, I re re didn't realize I had to sign up, but I'll know that for next time. <laughs> Uh, John Newman, 590 Towner Swamp Road, Guilford, Michael's neighbor, and I won't try to top what he said, so I'm going to go in a completely different direction. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to offer my comments regarding the proposed changes to the planning and zoning regulations. I'm here this evening to speak neither in support of nor in opposition to the proposed changes, but to uh, request an extension of the public comment period. In order to engage a larger portion of the Guilford residents and to give the commission and staff the opportunity to make a make the proposed plans understandable to the general public. Sorry, I've been writing and rewriting that. My suggestions are as follows. Uh, proactive communication. I understand that the commission met the minimum notification standards. However, I would suggest that the commission reach out proactively using a variety of channels, including email, mail, social media, and the town's mass notification system to let the general populace know that these meetings are taking place. It goes without saying that land use decisions, including changes to planning and zoning regulations, are fundamentally political decisions. And Democrat, in democratic societies, decisions that significantly impact the public must have public input. Without this input, decisions may not can't even read my writing, may not reflect the needs and desires of the community. When a large portion of the residents are involved in the process and understand the changes, it can further legitimize the decisions. If people feel their voices have been heard, they are more likely to accept and support the final outcome, even if it's not exactly what they wanted. Increased public input can ensure the changes are fair and equitable. Without the public's input, there's a risk that the changes may disproportionately benefit certain groups at the expense of others. Name this next one, dissemination of the plans. Use clear and plain language, avoiding technical jargon or legalistic language. Create a clear and easy to understand educational materials about the changes. This could include frequently asked questions, renderings showing the proposed changes versus current regulations, and simple but complete summaries of the proposed changes. 
Be transparent about the process. Explain exactly why the changes are, are proposed and who would be affected. Acknowledge feedback received, how to influence the rule changes, and if certain suggestions were not adopted, explain why. And this is a tough one. And finally, I would suggest the commission temporarily pause the process until a new town planner is appointed. And then I have a question. Will the number and quality of comments that have been submitted necessitate the reopening of public comment period? Answer, or you can email me. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, just uh, <clears throat> thank you for your comments. And just with regard to the last comment, I think the regulations are sort of a, like an application submitted by an applicant. Comments are being made by the community. We're tabulating all of these. We can make modifications to the regulations to address these comments. If we were to make a significant uh, change uh, that had not been incorporated into the regulations, um, I would perhaps advise the commission that we should maybe restart the public hearing process. But if we're responding to comments and incorporating what the community has, has suggested, even though some of those changes may be directions, if, if they're moving backwards, if you will, from some of the changes that we've proposed, that's what the community has requested. I don't think we need a new application process for that. So I'll coach and advise you through this as, as that happens, um, because I think we want to do the right thing for the community in, in terms of responding to that. So I think we're in comfortable territory at the present time. And as we our discussions unfold, we'll talk about that further. All right. I see heads raised. So I'm assuming we Joseph Walensky was the first one to raise, so it's okay. Great. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm in favor of affordable housing. Uh, but I please, am... please state your name and, and, and name and address. Yes, sir. Joseph Walensky, Town of Swamp Road. I'm in favor of affordable housing, but I am strongly opposed to high density, large scale housing projects. One of the major concerns for high density housing in Guilford, such as the current large proposal for the Sullivan property on Moose Hill, is the probability of surface water and groundwater contamination from overburdened high density septic systems. Connecticut Public Health Code requires that failed septic systems be repaired. But the definition of failure is often subjective and some septic systems are more difficult to evaluate than others, meaning that unless there's a visible health threat, such as pooling surface contamination or backflow into a house, there's really no legal requirement to repair an improperly working septic system. So repairs often are not made until the area has become distinctly odiferous, which indicates that the system is already a health threat. If high density housing is built on Moose Hill, the health of surrounding neighbors are put at unnecessary risk since they are all down gradient of groundwater beneath a new high density septic system. Imagine having 120 apartments placed on the apex of Moose Hill overlooking your front yard. That's what we are faced with here on Town of Swamp Road if high density housing is approved. At the very least, I recommend respectfully the committee, your committee, consider requiring additional space on high density sites be allowed for future upgrades and expansion of septic systems at high density sites in the case of failure. Two septic systems on our road have failed and they were both built to code. It's just the soil in this area is poor. Furthermore, in areas that were once formed, such as the Sullivan property, steps need to be taken proactively and subsequent to development to evaluate water quality, to assess for residual pesticides and herbicides. Both are known neural toxins. They can negatively impact adults, children, and embryos during critical stages of development. I thank you for your time and for your service to this community. For next up, the next person to bring the hand was Ed Griffin. Yours. 
currently muted, so uh, you're ready to speak. There you go. Is this for M. Griffin? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. I actually have it in my daughter's login, so I apologize. My name's Ashley Griffin, and um, I just want to speak briefly only because I just learned about this today, and I don't have, have a lot of in-depth knowledge about it yet, but I definitely already feel strongly that the Guilford residents aren't really completely aware or even aware at all or informed of these potential regulations that are being um, suggested. And I disagree with them. Um, I feel very concerned that there's a lot of, lot of natural assets in Guilford and established residential neighborhoods that will be adversely affected by any new regulations that I've heard about um, because they don't seem to be very mindful of already well-established neighborhood communities and as, and as well as the unique not, as well as the unique natural and historical assets within our town. Um, and I think something like that can easily and irreversibly damage the quality and the character of our town. Um, Guilford's unique, and I don't want to see any more cement coming in and somebody trying to profit, as does happen, because it helps them make money, but it hurts our town. Um, I feel like the residents of Guilford, most of them, are completely unaware of what's going on. And this isn't fair that they're not appropriately informed, appropriately informed about things like this. Um, I don't wanna see our town get hurt and irreversibly damaged. So I disagree with the proposed regulations and um, think that the community and the public needs to be informed and be able to participate in anything like this going forward as far as building, et cetera, within our town. And that's just my two cents quickly without having had much time to think um, in depth about the details I'd like to speak about. Thank you. What is your address? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Your address. My address is 1350 Boston Post Road, Guilford. Thank you. You're welcome. Next is Todd Anderson. Todd Anderson. <clears throat> Hi, sorry, my computer was frozen for a minute there. Um, Todd Anderson from Anderson Engineering and Surveying Associates, 1054 Boston Post Road here in Guilford, Connecticut. Um, in, in reiterating what, um, I forget what the architect's name was, Michael, I think. Um, I agree with everything he stated as well. Um, a few things that, you know, I early on years ago, <clears throat> I was a member of the committee to rewrite these regulations. And the original intent was to make the regulations better and <clears throat> less obtrusive for properties who were um, unfortunately made mandated to uh, succumb to more stringent regulations, uh, i.e. the R8 zoning, where a lot of subdivisions were approved under R5 and R6 zoning, then they were placed in R8. And I've gone through numerous Zoning Board of Appeals applications for those properties. So I want to commend the commission, first off, uh, on realizing that a lot of these properties in town are uh, in zones that they shouldn't be in. So the part of the regulation where 
there's concessions for those properties. I want to commend the powers that be um, that change the regulations to make those more compliant. Um, the parts of the regulations that I don't agree with are um, R2. For some reason, the rear setback got changed from 15 feet to 20 feet. I don't know where that came from. Uh, prior to Jamie's uh, sudden departure from the town staff, I asked her and she said she didn't know where that came from. So you need to look at where that came from and why, because under my estimation, there are about 250 to 300 properties in the R2 district. I have not done an analysis of how many of them have accessory structures closer than 20 feet to the rear line. I don't think anyone on town staff has done that analysis. I think that analysis really needs to be done before you increase that setback by five feet and all of a sudden make a potential 200 properties non-compliant. And when they go to make their garage into an accessory dwelling unit. Now all of a sudden they're before ZBA. The intent of these this regulation change is to hopefully have less properties going before ZBA. And under just that one regulation, you are going to make a lot more properties go before ZBA unnecessarily. Um, the other one is the uh, definition in the regulations of projections. They are one part of the regulation says projections in the tables, projections only on principal buildings can be three feet outside of the principal building. So all of these accessory buildings that we have built on the building line that have roof eaves and gutters and so forth, now all of a sudden are going to be non-compliant. Yet there is another part of these new regulations that say that all buildings can have projections. Which is it? There's contradictory words in your new regulations that don't fit. So I know at the last meeting, you guys said, oh, we realize we're going to have to make some changes. It's been four years. Why have these changes not been looked at and not been made yet? So it's, you know, it's an imperfect regulation. Why approve something knowing that it's not perfect? when you've had four years to make a regulation perfect. And once you ratify these regulations and approve them, professionals like myself have to live up to these regulations until some date when you make them better and make them right. How long is that going to take? Is it going to be another four years that professionals like myself have to deal with these flawed regulations and go to ZBA or deal with it until they are changed and made right. Um, the other thing is I'm looking at the stormwater regulations and there is no concise stormwater event that you guys are asking for. So are you asking for a one year event? five-year event, 25-year event, 50-year event, 100-year event, it's not spelled out. So me as a professional, I bid on a job and I say, well, I think the Wetlands Commission, the Plain Zoning Commission is going to want us to design to the 100-year storm. So we go in and we say, okay, we're, we can fit with all the stormwater requirements, we can fit 20 units. Yet somebody else comes along and goes, oh, no, I can push through with a 10-year storm. I can get 40 units on that property. I lose a job to that guy who's like, oh, no, I can push it through. There's no concise regulation as to what you guys are going to regulate. And I'm also concerned that 
did the town engineer have any input on any of these regulations? Because I think not. The way that it's written, it looks like it's copy and pasted from another town. This town is not a copy and paste town. We are our own town. So if these regulations were copy and pasted from another town, it may or may not fit our town. And without the input of the town engineer or a third party qualified engineer who knows stormwater, how can you write these regulations and regulate what we as professionals have to adhere to, especially being as vague as they are written? Because it doesn't work. It's not right. It needs to be fixed before you can approve these regulations. Um, I've got a few other points, but I think I'll yield my time and let me collect my thoughts and I'll come back to you guys again and continue on to somebody else. And I will calm down and then come back again. Thank you. So from here, I don't have a clear order of showing who raised their hands in what order. So we'll go alphabetically by last name. So Joyce, do we go? Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Joyce Apolito. I live at 586 Towner Swamp Road. And um, I basically just wanted to make a quick statement to say that I'm opposed to the proposed regulations as they are currently written. Um, I believe it would be beneficial to have a comprehensive town plan that's written and approved before any of these rezoning changes are finalized. Um, so basically, I wanted to reiterate I agree with what Michael Scott and um, other people have put forward much more eloquently, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Now, continuing to go alphabetically, next would be Sarah Shrewsbury. Sarah. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Okay, um, thank you to the commission for all of your hard work. I know this has been in the plannings for a very long time. Um, I would say, I want to repeat what several other people have said tonight, and that is, um, especially Mary Jo Kessner and a, and a couple of others, that we should not be rushing into a decision. This is too important for our town, and we as taxpayers deserve a much better, more concise explanation of what is changing and why. What are the goals it's too hard as it is right now to for an average person to, or even for some of the experts, to really understand what is changing and why it's changing. And we need something very simple that everybody can get their heads around. And I also think we need to press pause until we have a new planner in place. Um, thank you all for your work. That's all. Next would be Karen Scott. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, I'm Karen Scott at uh, 593 Towner Swamp Road. Um, so I just want to thank you for your time and the opportunity for public comments. So I'm going to reiterate the um, uh, comments that I've hear, heard tonight and um, during the last hearing, uh, but I think it is important to restate them. So, um, so I'm an architect and urban planner. I've been practicing for over 25 years. Um, I believe it's irresponsible to approve the proposed changes. Um, it doesn't meet a standard of care that the town, that the homeowners expect and deserve. I suspect that the majority of residents are not anticipating the extent of changes that are proposed, the extent of the impact on those changes, um, and the extent that they diverge from previous Guilford master plans and reports. So I encourage you, I encourage us, the town, to go through a proper sequence where you have a shared vision, a master plan that the community understands, you get input, and then you put in place zoning regulations um, that can help 
manifest that master plan. It seems like we're going in the reverse order where we have regulations. I think these regulations were supposed to be a cleanup and they've turned into a, a, a much larger overhaul. Um, so I just encourage us to encourage us to have a master plan and um, and pause until we have a town planner. Thank you. <clears throat> and finally, we have Jonathan Silbert. Good evening. I'm John Silbert. I live at 584 Town of Swamp Road. I've been in Guilford now for more than half a century, the last 41 years of which have been right here on Town of Swamp. I'd like to begin by saying how much I respect the effort being made at a comprehensive revision of Guilford's zoning regulations. It's the right thing to try to do and to try to do right. And the document clearly reflects a great deal of time, effort, and thought. And so it therefore pains me to have to suggest to you that while perhaps some sections could be carved out to enable adoption now, the better approach would be to decline to adopt the proposal at all at this time and to begin the process anew. But this time, I would hope, with greater attention to and fidelity toward, among other things, the existing 2015 Guilford Route 1 West Planning Committee and its report and recommendations. With its emphasis on preservation of much of the existing landscape, including specific references to the Sullivan property just south of Route 1, that 2015 plan, which was also the product of a great deal of time, effort, and thought, either needs, either needs to be specifically repudiated, and I certainly hope that that would not be the Commission's preferred course of action, or else the proposed new regulations need to be reworked and harmonized so that the Commission's mandate of both planning and zoning is accurately reflected in the final product. I know that's a bitter pill to swallow. Somebody, probably several somebodies, obviously worked very hard on this. And for them, as well as for those hoping to hitch their development plans to what they clearly view as a more favorable set of regulations, having this proposal not come to fruition tonight will no doubt be a disappointment. I get that, by the way. I, I spent 21 years as a judge of the Superior Court. There were some, thankfully not many, but some occasions where having drafted what I thought was a terrific memorandum of decision, I then took a long, hard look at what I had written and what I thought was a finished product and realized reluctantly that it did not accomplish what I wanted to accomplish, that it had not taken into account all that needed to be taken into account, that it did not do justice, and that it had to be scrapped and started from scratch and often with a different result. I did not enjoy coming to the realization that my initial thoughts had been wrong, but I did what I had to do. The analogy of that situation to the proposed regulations is imperfect, but the basic point of that is that my faithfulness, to my oath of office required me to start over and to try to get it right. When we take oaths to uphold the law, whether as members of local volunteer boards and commissions or as state constitutional officers, one of our occupational hazards is that we're sometimes called upon to make the kinds of decisions that will disappoint some people. What is ostensibly a noble effort to honor the memory of a young boy from a neighboring town by erecting, by erecting an athletic facility, a complex that will bear his name, in fact proposes to create one of the largest, if not the largest, multifaceted developments this town has ever seen. One that is potentially enabled by proposed regulations that ignore previous planning and present the prospect of the ruination of the neighborhood in which I reside. What are apparently good intentions can never be a justification for doing the wrong thing. Now, I'm not a planning and zoning expert, I don't propose to try to identify every offensive aspect of the proposed reg regulations. My comments here are based primarily on my perception of the violence this proposal does to a part of town in which I live, and particularly in the context of the proposed creation of a truly monstrous development that would change forever the landscape that the 2015 plan sought to preserve and protect. While my neighbors and others have all addressed and will probably continue to address specific components of the proposed regulations. My focus here is not so much on the substance of individual regulations as much as it is on procedure, on process. 
this effort to revamp the zoning regulations when superimposed on the proposed development at the west end of Route 1 is clearly inconsistent with the letter and spirit of prior planning. And I think it's inconsistent with what much of Guilford is all about. I understand, of course, this was hardly the intention of those who drafted these proposed regulations. And therefore, the only law that I will cite to you today is one that you will not find in the Connecticut General Statutes. It's the somewhat metaphorical law, the law of unintended consequences, the frequently observed observation in which an action produces results that are not part of the actor's purposes. But whether intended or unintended, consequences are real. And when those consequences are destructive of the fabric of a town, as these will be, at least in our part of town, they cannot be countenanced by the responsible governmental agencies. I urge you to decline to adopt these proposed regulations tonight. And I thank you both for your service to the town and its people and for your attention to all of us this evening. That was uh, one uh, from Sarah Thank you. I'm sorry to hold this up and that I jumped on late here, but Sarah Delaventura, 54 Huckleberry Court. Um, I'm just, I, I want to reiterate what many have said here that I've heard in the last 10, 15 minutes, but um, I thank you all for your diligence and your hard work that you have spent in uh, working on these regulations. There is obviously still work to be done. Um, there's a lot of spoken on an opposition of certain sections of the regulations. Um, the one thing that I would ask specifically is that you would highly consider um, passing certain sections that you are not hearing any opposition on. Specifically, there's the agricultural um, amendments that have been made, specifically uh, not only us for bishops, but for other farms that are trying to move forward and to continue doing business in town. Um, these regulations, a lot of them, the, the current ones are antiquated. Um, there's a lot of things in there that it does not allow our farm and other farms to do um, that would not be disturbances to, to many um, and to the community. Um, so my, my ask is that you, while moving forward and possibly holding off on, on passing the regulations as a whole, that you would consider passing certain sections that you're not hearing opposition on um, to help us to continue to do business in this community. Bishop. Right there. Go ahead, Keith. Okay, thank you. Just unmuting, I'm muting here. I'll open up my screen as well. Uh, thank you very much again. Um, I won't reiterate uh, my thanks to the commission and the work. And as uh, Jamie had indicated at your last hearing, I've been one community member that has been on and at most of the meetings during the process here, and it has been pretty thorough. Like that, I understand it is uh, very daunting for many of the changes that start to get very technical as well. So um, I just follow up on my request last time and what uh, Sarah Del Ventura just spoke to a minute ago, specifically the sections relating to the farming changes that were vetted out very well with the Ag Commission. That is section 6.1 through 6.10. Um, I feel they could stand on their own, that they could be adopted um, if the rest of the sections were having to be set aside. And the other section I'd ask for that same consideration would be the uh, wind and solar energy sections there as we work to embrace uh, those technologies and requirements for renewable energy sources. And that is section 8.1. And so I'd hope that legal counsel could look closely at that and uh, Gwen to uh, see if those could be adopted independently without putting those things off as um, it might seem you'll be doing due diligence on the other sections based upon comments. Thank you. Well, we have hands online. Is there anyone else here in the audience that would like to speak? My name is Lisa Domingo, and I live in 21 Kenneth Circle. And I'd just like to thank all my neighbors from Commerce Farm Valley for their very articulate uh, remarks tonight. I would like to say I agree with them. I urge you to not adopt this in the form. I'd also like to say that I'm a nurse, and when I speak to my patients, I'm very careful to speak in a way that they understand. 
I think you were very diplomatic this evening to say that it's hard to engage with code. I frankly don't understand the majority of what has been written. And I don't think that it's fighting to do for the residents of Guildford. We do agree with those who said we deserve to know what, what's going on here and how it will impact our, our neighborhoods. So um, I just want to thank you all for your comments again. Things from the audience and any other comments from the Zoom call. Okay, um, at this point, we I'd like to call the uh, commissioners uh, to see if we feel like we need to extend uh, public comment on this item or if we feel like we are looking to close public comment on this item. Um, I'll go through here, Kevin. Uh, oh, I, I definitely. I want to extend and I, I want to throw out one other thing. I, I'm wondering if there's something else that we need to do as commission or as town staff to get this out there more into the public eye. I, I, I've been getting a lot in the last week or two that people just aren't aware of what's going on. They're, they're, they hadn't known about it or they're just hearing about it. I don't understand why that is. It certainly seems like there's, an, there's been an effort to get the word out there. One thing I found troubling was that the courier was here tonight. And as soon as the map application was tabled, they left. They, that should be should be funky news on, on any little any paper that would take it. That being said, I offer extending the public hearing. All right, Larry. Uh, uh, I think extending it is is a good thing. I'm wondering uh, if we could. Uh, meld in some of these uh, changes that are uh, technical or, or that are uh, very obvious so so that when we have another hearing people are looking at uh, revisions that were made that would that would require us to yeah. to end to basically mm -hmm. vote now and restart that would require us to withdraw and restart well i don't want to do it <laughs> but um, I guess I, I, I think it, it's hard. Yeah, let's extend comments uh, uh, before we do that. Um, but we may well, I mean, what's the process? Because uh, if we close the comment period, right, then we're going to make all these revisions, and now we have something different. Is that akin to starting it over again? No. Um, the, the, only, the only requirement to start it over again is if we are starting to add something to the application. <laughs> if we're revising the application or if we're calling things from the application, um, then that is fine um, with basically the process. So again, the process, just to reiterate for everyone, uh, when we close public hearing on the item, that is the signal then for, um, for Glenn to finalize all the comments that we've gotten to this point both in our meetings as well as online. And then at the next meeting following that, he will present all of those items to us and we'll go through them, talk about what changes to make to based off of that comment, what changes not. Perhaps because if we're not changing, we're just making revisions, perhaps in your spreadsheet, you can uh, put things that are still controversial and things that we're likely to uh, accept because that way, when we get that out to the public, they can say, oh, here are all the comments. These are ones the commission is, is inclined to, and these are comments that you know, are, are still up in the air. So that uh, the next comment period could be refined, you know, so, so that it could be stepped forward. Is there a next comment period? Well, that's where I think that's what we're talking about, and I I, I think we should have one, but I think. Well, I mean, I think well, what's your thought on that? I think this is the commission's call. I think as Scott points out. I, I feel correctly that um, we're having a dialogue with the community to get comments and feedback. We've received a lot of uh, interesting input as part of this. I think there comes a point in time where the commission says, in a sense, all right, time out. Let's now compile the comments and organize them. And there's different comments from different people. 
with it's got to be organized and then we yeah. can see listen you know i think mr bishop tonight said section six of the regulations uh, there's really no comments on section six one through six ten so those are good um, but there may be some other sections that you'll see there's quite a bit of comment on. i think eventually it comes down to the commission's decision about how to proceed at that time i think as scott points out we can actually make changes or edits or suggest what those are and the commission could say this I feel comfortable this falls within what the community has been asking us to do, or the commission may say, you know what, maybe it's prudent for us to just pause here, withdraw this application. You don't have to deny your own application. You could withdraw it and go back to public hearing again. You may get exactly the same comments regardless, yeah. but, but I think the commission's in charge that you're the applicant, so you're in the reviewers. You're in charge of the process. My job, in a sense, is to help you and help the community come to a decision about what it is you want to do. So I think um, if you wanted to keep the hearing open, see what we get for comments at some point in time, I'm looking forward, I mean, maybe I should be starting now to, to sort of organize and compile these, but I'm gonna to try to give you some input and feedback. So, so one, one of the problems is this isn't, hasn't been that much of a, a conversation. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we've had people speak, you know, I get three minutes to speak and, without any dialogue back and forth, right? I, and I think that's an element that's somehow lacking. And, and I'm trying to suggest a way that we can have that dialogue. So I, I think this, 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 this is, like, this is uh, Sean, Sean right. Custer. Um, and I think uh, Glenn and I had uh, touched on this at a prior meeting and I've heard um, from people outside the confines of a meeting structure, um, just, you know, being in the public, um, why we can't have something that could be put in the public domain for people to examine and, and ideally, based on comments tonight, be broadcast in a, in a better, more effective way of the... Um, specific segments of the code that have changed. Um, I don't want to use this, the word substantially, but meaning, maybe the word, the better word is meaningfully, um, like a before and after. And, um, and, and then a logic for the, the change. Because when we started this whole process, and I was much younger then, um, it, it, it was really about making the code more approachable, making it more readable, um, making it more friendly to the users, you know, both the professionals, um, you know, like Russ and, and all the other people that are, that are attending tonight, but also just the general public that want to build an accessory apartment or want to, you know, put a shed in their backyard and want to be sure that they're complying. So what I'm basically saying is I, I am I am in pause mode. That's where I am. So you'd prefer to withdraw at this point. Yeah, I, I, I think based on comments and uh, the, the, obvi the obvious involvement of, you know, the number of people we've had, which, you know, exceeds almost yeah. their meaning that we've had, there's interest in this. Uh, Bill, pretty Bill? He's muted. You, muted. Bill. I'm trying to unmute. There we go. Um, so, could, could Scott, could you explain or, or Glenn explain again the various uh, possible things I, I guess withdrawing is one at this point um the other one is if you close the hearing then is there any time limit for us to be able to discuss um some of these more uh thorny uh, issues no uh, the discussion can be as long as we need so the statutory time frames on an application deal with the concept of due process as it relates to an applicant you can't make an applicant wait for years for his decision the commission is the applicant and the reviewer, and you can take as much time as you feel you need to make a good decision. You don't have to act in 65 days after the close of the hearing, et cetera. 
people would like to behave in a timely way, but it's your call as to what to do. So I, I think uh, that's certainly a situation. I think that the situation uh, or the options that might be available to the commission at this point in time tonight would be, you could extend the hearing, you could close the hearing and direct me to get started on compiling the comments so you can see what we've got at this point in time in terms of our organized statement and reserve time later down the road for further decision making. Um, no, I, I, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll just add that there are potential applicants that are just waiting for this to be resolved so that they know, you know, what what their what their path is to getting an approval. And I think we, we've got to we've got to you know sit down and and find out where the where the weak points in you know what what we proposed are um, it, uh, maybe weak is not the right word it's just they're 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 not clear um, they don't keep, the public doesn't understand why we made the changes get it resolved. And move it forward so that the public knows where we stand. And then, um, you know, we can't, this this cannot go on for years and years. No, I think I'd just like to remind the commission and the community as well that we had a public meeting back in 2022 because we've been working on it for some time. We got started before COVID. COVID slowed us up big time because we couldn't really have meetings. We hadn't perfected yet this hybrid meeting or the online stuff and we weren't quite sure how to do all of that when we started to come out of that we had our first public meeting in Jan major public meeting in january of 22 um george and aaron had left jamie came on board jamie uh, over the course of the last year ran can't tell you how many uh, it's on the town website there's a list there of all yeah. the special things that were run on topics because these are the areas that were people were concerned and so there were explanatory meetings not everybody showed up that showed up here at the hearing. So why not? I don't, I don't know. I can't tell you. But we had another public meeting in January of 2023. So this has not happened in the background. It hasn't been hidden from the community. It's just either people are waking up late or they're not paying attention. I don't know. But that doesn't change the fact that we need to do what's right for Guilford in the long run. And I think the regulations did get started on the concept of making them easier to use, more user-friendly, clearer language, et cetera. But as problems were observed in the regulations, the issue was, well, we're we just going to reorganize it and leave the problems there. No, we were going to try to address those. And that's what started. And that's actually got how the process grew a little bit. So I think the regulations today are meant to accomplish multiple objectives. The LID provisions in the current regulations are a misfit from I'd say 20 years ago. They were great at the time. They are so far behind the times right now in terms of engineering and other things like that. So we're trying to bring Guilford into the new age. Um, but we shouldn't rush on this. And so I think uh, I leave it to the commission here to support. I would like to support you whatever direction you, you decide you'd like. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Owens. With all due respect to comments that have been made before, I would agree completely with Glenn. This has been one of the most open processes I've seen in my 32 years of elected service to this community. What, G what Jamie did in bringing sunlight to this process was unprecedented. The fact that some people did not pay attention until something came to their attention that was of concern to them does not diminish the work that this commission has done and commissioned through Jamie and Glenn. So, yes, I think there are some folks who are late to the dance who have some concerns because they've recently learned that there are things that are concerning to them. But I don't think that you should uh, throw this process out. I would say extend it and allow for further comments. I just, I, I think town staff has been done a disservice by some of the comments that I've heard tonight. This was the most open process I've seen in years. I'll get off my soapbox now. Thank you. Uh, all right, any comments, Bill, that you'd like to make? Um, yeah, only that I was, you know, 
I, I understand that there are people that have concerns, but I also understand that there are people who have been waiting, as Sean said. So I want to have Sean clarify to me, whether does he want us to withdraw this or does he want us to close it and then discuss it and iron out some of these, these thorny issues that are out there between us, you know, and we, according to what Glenn said, we have a fair amount of time to, to work through these things and get comments back from staff and, and look at how some of these things might affect, uh, you know, like some of the things Todd brought up. I, I don't really, I didn't notice those and I don't know if they're for in fact fact, but it would certainly be something to look into whether we're changing the, we're going to make a bunch of houses, uh, a bunch of structures non-conforming, but I don't, I don't, I think we should not withdraw by any means because I believe that we should keep moving, but I, I don't, I'm inclined to close it and then just do the hard work that we're supposed to do with, with the comments. Yeah, Bill, uh, Bill, I agree. I, I, I don't want to withdraw and, you know, just back away completely. I, I think we should, we should, you know, find a path to move forward in, in, um, you know, we, we owe it to the public to get this resolved. And, you know, I, I think there's, we, we can't, forget the fact or or miss the fact that if, if we if we get something not quite right and we approve these you know not these but a a regulation change to the code that we can all that can always be revisited and if there are things we have to refine we refine them and our, you know, and our, we will not be here forever, and our successors will do that as well. Yeah, I, I think we need to move forward, and we need to. I, 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 no, no, I think our, I think our, our, our motto should be move forward. Yes. I'm just trying to let everyone have the ability to make comments. Did that do yeah. anything you want to make I think that uh, Matt makes a good point. Um, <clears throat> This, this has been going on since before I came on the commission. Um, we've had a lot of hearings. Uh, and I think that uh, we've gotten a lot of input. I'm having a hard time keeping all of the input in my mind and that's why I think it may make some sense here to close the uh, hearing, let Glenn organize this, let's sit down and go through this section by section and where there have been constructive comments like this point about the R2 zone, the 15 feet, the 20 feet. I mean, I have no idea what technical reason for that was, but um, I think that a very valid question has been raised and that's the kind of thing that the commission needs to discuss. And, and, but on the other hand, there are significant portions of these changes that are non-controversial. And I think we can, you know, what we need to do is we need to narrow down the areas that we are going to consider. Let's, let's settle on some, and then we'll boil down to some others that we need to think about maybe a little more. But I, I don't, I, we, we've had, I don't know how many of these public hearings, and I think that we, uh, I think we need to sit down and, and sort this out at this point. Okay. Uh, last is uh, Ms. Johnson, Bob Johnson. Anything that you'd like to add to the discussion? Unless he left. Do you have a couple of people raising their hands or something else? <laughs> I see other folks have their hands up again. Is that? Yeah, I mean, again, please be brief because we're we're in the middle of the discussion. 
And again, we have a hard stop at 1030. Well, we haven't heard from uh, Marjorie Shansky, and I don't know if we've heard from Griffin, so. We have heard from Todd Anderson, and we're getting the first thing. This is not Ashley. a Ashley Berger. Thank you. So I'll start with Marjorie. Let's hear Marjorie's comments. Um, good evening, and thank you. I was disinclined to participate until you started to talk about closing the hearing. And I would like to say, since I have periodically attended these meetings over the several years that you've been working on it, which has been uh, illuminating, educational for me, and- um, hey, Marjorie, could you, you just state, uh, we know your name, just state okay. your address. Uh, sure, I'm attorney Marjorie Shansky. I'm at 61 East Grand Avenue in New Haven, but I appear before you periodically on behalf of property owners in Guilford. And uh, that is my abiding interest in what you are doing. Um, I would make this procedural observation in these hybrid meetings, Mr. Chair, if the members who are in the room could identify themselves when they speak, it's impossible unless one is familiar with their voice to understand who's saying what, just as an observation. I'm hoping that before you uh, shut down the regulation that somebody will do a, a big grammar and syntax review of it because there are some screaming issues that I know the town doesn't want to associate itself with as a, a published document. Um, the complexity of what I'm hearing this evening is that in both reformatting the regulations and revising the regulations, you've created a situation where even if you want to adopt Mr. Bishop's um, plea for the uh, chapter six agricultural changes, are you going to do that in a 273 hyphen fashion and, and, and incorporate it into the existing formatting or are you going to independently reformat and then be selective in the manner in which you uh, adopt various sections that and that's certainly a judgment this commission can make. And I think I endorse that notion because from perspective of uh, the things that are ready for adoption proceed, uh, fix them, amend them, edit them as common may have inspired you to do so uh, and then go forward. I think that um, if you have not recently had a legal review of the status of the regulations, I would commend that to your attention. I also have not heard much conversation about the subdivision regulation. I've heard no conversation about the subdivision regulations, but you and your planning commission role are responsible for those. Um, and they must be consistent with the zoning regulations. So if and to the extent something that you're about to change in the zoning regulations is going to affect the subdivision regulations, you really need to be doing that simultaneously in order to create a coherent body of law. Uh, I, I take note of the amount of nonconformity that has been described to be created by the regulations and urge you to take a look at that because one of the, one of the rules under the Connecticut General Statutes is to reduce conformity, reduce nonconformity to conformity as quickly as the equities permit. It certainly is not the primary role of a zoning commission to create nonconformities. Um, I would also say, having studied uh, with some interest the affordable housing section that, um, and listening to the comments this evening, that there's a perfect opportunity for a more formal engagement with the affordable housing committee to get to a place that is perhaps more creative, more equitable and will not have as stultifying effect on housing development in Guilford as the current iteration suggests that it might. Uh, and then listening to Judge Silbert's eloquence uh, begs the question of the extent to which the ancillary plans, because Guilford is distinguished for having done sections of town in individual plans, are you about to embark on inconsistency with those plans? Do those plans need to um, officially need to be abrogated or, or 
rejected or redone in a way like we amend a plan of conservation and development if circumstances change that want us to take a different direction. So I think there's an enormous potential here. I had a concern on behalf of my own clients whose interests are not necessarily represented in the draft, either map or text. Something I discuss with Jamie periodically, Jamie, shouldn't we like be changing this into the regulations now? And she would say, no, do it afterward. And so my sense is the commission needs to understand that the adoption of a recodification is not an achievement and an ending, it's really a beginning. It's the beginning of the next evaluation of, of the direction in which the town proceeds to move. So I congratulate you on the hard work. I will say that under the Connecticut Zoning Enabling Act, the legislature has bestowed an awesome responsibility on you members of the commission and that the amount of input that you've taken from the public has been substantial. I'm not one who believes that uh, every last person needs to have every last opportunity. You've made myriad opportunities for people to be heard um, and that you now take the task of trying to incorporate what is meaningful and right into the regulations. And I wish you well on that. Thank you. Um, so I'm the last to kind of express my opinion. I believe that we have put in an extensive amount of work on this item to make it all as, um, as put out there to the public as possible. Um, every time that there's been a suggestion um, that instead of one meeting, we should have two, we've done that. Every time there's been a suggestion that we should reach out to a certain group or another, we've done that. Um, and uh, I think at this point, it, I feel that extending it another meeting for another round of public comments, I'm not sure we're going to get much more in the way of new comments. Um, it feels to me like, you know, law of diminishing returns when it comes to the comment period. Um, I think now is the time to um, end public hearing and um, put the onus on Glenn to take everything that we've heard and present it to us in a way that we can go through each item and discuss whether, you know, exactly that, the, the specific points that are brought up, <laughs> as well as some of the general ones also have value as well. So um, that's my opinion where we are. Um, I think that's the direction that we should go. Um, and I ask a question. Yes, sir. But is there any reason that we can't uh, uh, close public hearing, but still accept written comments? Because while uh, uh, all the comments are collated, uh, we do our deliberations that take some time. I don't know that we need another public hearing, but I think if people want to write written comments, is there anything to stop us from taking them? Um, I'm, I'm thinking out of the box because I don't know the box. The only thing I would suggest, just so that we pro proper, uh, follow proper procedures, like there were some people that mentioned that spoke here tonight and mentioned that they have some written things that they want to give as part of their testimony. I'm fine with accepting those items those people um but i think the website's been up for yeah. for a long time we've been putting this out there as, as many channels as we can find to put it out there um so i, I think i think that ship is essentially procedurally we need to close public hearings and put it in the so I, I i agree scott i the window's going to close you know i mean ice cream parlors don't stay open until you know, 2 a.m so we're just going to have to and how about give it two more weeks? Who's the window? I, 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 what do you think? What else are we going to hear in the next two weeks? I, I, I don't know. Probably not. I agree with you. Probably not yeah, much okay. more. I'm sure. thinking at least if you allow two more weeks for those for those outstanding comments that you're talking about now. They can't be submitted if you close tonight. Well, I'm, well, I'm just all I'm saying is that that's part of their testimony that they made here tonight. Okay. They can be submitted. As far as I'm concerned. Oh, they, yeah, and they will be submitted, right? Yes. Okay. Um, Scott, I have a question about um, meetings. Are we? Um, what's the protocol if you want to have uh, additional meetings that are specifically focused on on digging into these uh, sort of nitty gritty oh. issues? So I'll discuss with town staff as well as we plan whether we want to do special meetings or if we wanted just to each 
I, I, I think, you know, where you're going, where you're going uh, Bill, is we have, this is our work to do. Yes. And the public hearings are over. Yeah. We need to have some special meetings where we really focus deeply. So Ted, and, and Ted, to Ted's point, there are areas that, I, I, that I'm confused by. And I, you know, I, I, I want to be, have an open conversation where Glenn and, and uh, town staff and people can help us uh, sort of weed through it and yep. sort of figure out what, what it really means. You know, that's our job. So I agree. I agree. I, I, think, I think we need to have special meetings to deal with this because I mean, we have, we have a backlog of people who have applications for you know daycare centers and this kind of stuff. We can't back all that stuff up. I mean, these meetings, the discussion with Glenn, it's going to take a while. And unless we're going to have meetings that start at 6 p.m. and then are over at 3 in the morning, you can't do uh, you know every other Wednesday and do our regular business and then take on this too. It just yeah. we're going to have to have separate meetings. Yep, we will. We'll discuss that. Um, like I said, we'll discuss it with town staff and with fun and amongst ourselves to figure out what that process is. Um, but at hand is um, we would need to make a motion to close public hearing on this item. So we'll like to second. 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 There's a little second. Is that any any further discussion? So anyone wants to make quickly. Yes. Steve. Steve. I I'd like to just some clarification as to what you are what kind of dialogue you're allowing, what kind of new information you're allowing after the close of the public hearing. Well, it's not really new information. It's there. They're going to be the only thing that's going to happen is there's going to be a collation of all the comments that have, we've gotten from the public both online and from our meetings. It's going to be collated with Glenn and town staff together, and then it's presented to us and discussed both by Glenn and we, and uh, as well as town staff can be part of that discussion as well. I, I, uh, I think I think what Steve is asking is if we get another um, public comment in the form of an email or a letter, a physical letter. That arrives at planning and zoning, are we saying that the, given the public hearing is closing tonight, are we going to accept it? No. Is that what we're asking Steve. Correct. They were not, they were not yeah, able. yeah. I just want to make sure that we're we're if right. we're closing the public hearing, we're closing the public comment period entirely. Right. Right. Forms. Right. Exactly. Thank so you. We don't have any. There's no in between, unfortunately. It, it, that's just the way that the process works. Nope. I just want to make sure procedurally we're. I, I, I appreciate right that. I needed that clarification Steve. myself. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Any other discussion from our commissioners? All right, we'll go through and vote. Larry Rizzolo? Uh, yes. Kevin Clark? Yes. Ted Sands? Yes. Bill Freeman? Yes. Bill Johnson? I think we lost him. Sean Cosgrove? Aye. And I also vote yes. Uh, that ends our public hearing for this meeting as well. So we'll move on to the regular meeting. Uh, yeah, but I just think my intention is to now compile comments that we have received, written for comments and everything else. Um, we tabulated where we were as of this afternoon. We were up to 62 separate communications. Now that included written, but it also included the oral testimony from people at the last meeting and now what we've heard here tonight. There's enough material that I would request that I have about two weeks to get this together and give you guys two weeks to look at it. So in other words, I think our next meeting getting together would be early July, either in a, a regular meeting, depending on your agenda, or as you pointed out, possibly a special meeting. But I think it's going to take me about two weeks to get all of this stuff organized in a way that I think will help you uh, go through your evaluation. So, so I'll I would ask you and, and Steve to come up with, you know, when do we want to meet to discuss what the process is going to be going yeah. forward? Not, by your next meeting, we should have a pretty good plan as to where we're going to be scheduled. Yeah, and I think we can we can base that on the volume of applications we get. If we get a very, very low volume of applications, we could do, you know, something resembling a special meeting during our regular regularly scheduled meeting. Yeah. It wouldn't need to be a 
it would just be filling filling part of our regular meeting. Yes, exactly. That's, that's exactly. So if, right. Yeah, if it happens to be a slow meeting, we can also discuss it during the regular meeting as well as right. Yeah. Twice a week. Correct. We, we can do a lot of things. So, yeah. so we'll just discuss it and come up with the best process. Um, okay. Uh, we do have one new application, uh, Todd K. Anderson, Anderson Engineering and Surveying Associates, 187, Three Mile Forest, Map 70, Block EPA, Zone R3, Subdivision and Coastal Site Plan to split existing parcel into two new lots of equal size. Uh, received and set for June 21st, 2023. You'll hear a motion, please. Make a motion, we accept it. Bill, we have a second. Second. Uh, Larry Zolo? Yes. Bill Clark? Yes. Todd Sands? Yes. Bill Freeman? Yes. Johnson is abstaining. Sean Crossgrove? Aye. Uh, so yes. We'll see that on the June 27th meeting. Um, all right. Other commission business. Approval of the minutes. Is anyone able to review the minutes from our May 17th meeting? I looked at them. They look substantially correct. We're going to make a motion to approve. So move. And Sean, for a second. Second. Thank you, Bill. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there any abstentions? Other than Bill? All right. Motion carries. Um, Sean or, or Nigel or Janique, is there any other items that we need to discuss? No. Uh, Steve, do you have anything else? No, thank you. All right, and I didn't take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Larry. And I'll give a second to Sean. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank, thank nice. you, Scott. Great meeting. Good job. Good, good Great job, meeting for, for the new thank meeting. You. Thanks. Thank you, Walter. Bye. Possibilities. Absolutely. Oh, we considered every possibility. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yeah